This is AUGforums.com Real Talk. First, thank you to our sponsors. First, thank you to our sponsors, APS Payments, Kenzium, and DataSelf. You can learn more about how our sponsors work with Acumatica by going to AUGforums.com slash sponsors. My name is Tim Rodman, and I'm coming to you live on Thursday, October 29th, 2020. This is episode number 30. Eric Velkley, CTO at Penair, sharing his Acumatica customer story. And Eric, thanks for joining us today. I'll let you go ahead and start off by introducing yourself. All right, Tim, thank you very much for having me on. Um, so I'm Eric Velkley. I'm the CTO here for Penair. Um, give you a background. I've been doing IT for 20 some odd years. Uh, started off um, right out of college, actually uh, cutting my teeth on ERP uh, with AMP Incorporated and Harrisburg PA. Uh, as an SA, actually uh, cutting my teeth on ERP uh, with AMP Incorporated and Harrisburg PA uh, as an SAP basis administrator. Uh, so installing the system, maintaining servers, that kind of thing, patching. Um, from there, uh, moved jobs and uh, got more into just the IT side of the world, uh, doing everything. So really jack of all trades um, throughout my career. Been uh, doing ERPs off and on, um, dabbled with Solomon uh, back in 2005-ish uh, with Robson Forensic down in Lancaster. Um, did a little bit with Great Plains for about a three-month stint at another company and uh, ended up um, at Thermacore in 2008, uh, moving them from SAP onto Epicor Vantage. Uh, which was a, a two-month implementation project. So they, they had a major financial investment if they didn't get off in two months. So it was exciting. <laughs> um, was there for 10 years, um, you know, working with and maintaining uh, Epicor's product. And um, when uh, I looked to leave from there, ended up over here at Penn Air. Came in as the director of technology. I was actually IT guy number one for the company company. Uh, so prior to my arrival, everything was managed service provider. Um, big focus for the company there was really uh, making technology a priority for the business, uh, looking to move off of their existing uh, ERP, <laughs> air quotes for you, um, onto a real product. Um, and really uh, just, like I said, making technology the forefront of what the company's all about. Um, our, our CEO, um, he was here for about five years prior to me, and his, his whole focus was uh, historical, you know, standard distributor of parts into something that's, that's farther reaching, more sustaining, and uh, really puts the company at the forefront of our industry. Um, so I've been here since 2018, um, started June 25th. And uh, my, my first order of business was actually hiring IT guy number two. And uh, he started um, roughly end of September. And then uh, he and I really kicked into gear on um, selection process for replacing our old ERP, which was Tribute. Uh, Tribute was, I believe it was started around the end of the 1980s, maybe early 90s time frame when it was created. Um, the company was that created it actually was a distributor and they needed something that was really purpose built for their industry. Uh, actually type what screen you wanna go to into a little box, uh, you change screens, you know, your typical process for really a DOS interface. Um, got them through. Uh, I believe they started in 94 uh, on Tribute and they pretty much went through until uh, 2018 on the same install. Uh, I believe they did one upgrade at that point. Um, definitely not something long-term, uh, you know, future sustainable, if you will. Um, in our process, we really narrowed down our selection to three products, um, which really was uh, Dynamics GP, uh, which honestly was our front runner for myself and Seth, uh, Acumatica, and Epicor Profit 21. Uh, 
Um, so we met with partners for each and uh, really went through a fairly heavy vetting process um, of what the capabilities are, um, heavy vetting process um, of what the capabilities are, um, how it would uh, operate within our, you know, sphere of influence and uh, really looking at the technical side of it. And um, it was a mix of the technical approach as well as the partner that uh, um, dog and pony showed it for us, if you will, uh, that sold us on Acumatica. And like I said, GP was the front runner for both myself and the CEO. And, you know, we kept kind of going back and forth, which is the better product. And the more I learned about Acumatica, the farther GP fell off the map. And uh, so, you know, we made the decision to move forward with Acumatica and uh, Jan, 19, uh, Jan of 2019, we hit the ground running um, with our partner and myself and my, uh, my cohort, Evan. And so that was our implementation team. <laughs> I think you're in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, kind of way outside of Philadelphia <laughs> there, but Philadelphia is the closest, I think, bigger metro yep. area. What does Penair do? And I'm especially interested in your Epicor background and that Epicor was part of your selection process uh, and Epicor to, to me, at least being known more for manufacturing. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, just tell us about yeah. that. So, so uh, Penair is actually in York, Pennsylvania. Uh, it's only 30 minutes away from Lancaster, uh, but it's, it's significant. We, we like to put the, put York out there. Um, we're about an hour and 40 minutes, almost two hours outside of Philadelphia to give you a perspective. Um, so South Central PA. Um, Pen Air started 50-ish uh, years ago as really just a core distributor of pneumatic and hydraulic parts. Uh, so if you needed fittings, they had sales guys, they'd sell you parts and, and you know, they, they were really happy outside of Philadelphia to give you a perspective. Um, so South Central PA. Um, Pen Air started 50-ish uh, years ago as really just a core distributor of pneumatic and hydraulic parts. Uh, so if you needed fittings, they had sales guys, they'd sell you parts and, and you know, they, they were really happy. That core business still exists today, uh, but within the last, say, seven years, uh, we've expanded beyond just pneumatic and hydraulic parts into automation. Uh, we uh, design uh, build and install uh, really anything that you would want to have automated. So Penair's core business is, and what we really do is to help manufacturers in the areas of pneumatic, hydraulic, and automation. Um, big thing that we're really getting into is what they're calling uh, purpose-driven mobile robots. So we have, uh, you know, warehouse robots that, uh, so you go from parts distribution all the way to robotics. Um, and, you know, if, if you have a, a process that you want to automate, we'll figure it out and help you get there. Um, actually, within the last uh, six months, got, got the whole COVID year of who knows what time looks like anymore, but say six months, uh, we acquired a conveyor business. So we now actually manufacture stainless steel conveyors and uh, we'll, we'll sell those. So we're, we're all over the place um, with respect to the things that we can do. Uh, but the goal is to do them well enough that our customers can focus on, you know, getting their work done. And when they go home, they actually get to go home. Uh, so that, that's really so, pen area. That, I'm not sure. that your, your distribution company. And then when you talk about the automation, do you have then an engineering team? Would you say you're a manufacturing yeah, company absolutely. as well? Company and then when you talk about the automation, do you have then an engineering team? Would you say you're a manufacturing yep. company? Absolutely. As well. Yep. So okay. we we do uh, the distribution, the engineering design work, the manufacturing work. Uh, we have some manufacturing that we do as an outsource manufacturer, and uh, you know, and also the the robotic side of it. So we're we're a so very I'm interested wide then. I I don't know a lot about Epicor, but you had some Epicor background and it was in your selection process. I'm curious that I thought that was their strength. You know, maybe you could talk about how you found Acumatica comparing to Epicor right. on the manufacturing side specifically. Yeah. So um, Epicor's, uh, what used to be called Vantage is at some point became Epicor 
uh, I believe it was Epicor 9 or 10, whatever they wanted to call it. Um, that product is their heavy manufacturing product. Uh, Profit 21 e manufacturing capability within it, uh, which honestly was Profit 21. They just didn't have that capability. And when when we viewed the the demo for it, um, their their screen was it seemed like it was a single screen for every single thing you could do. So it was really cumbersome to to follow along on the demonstration. Uh, but you know, if if I were looking purely as a manufacturer. Uh, Epicor's, you know, their true enterprise product of Epicor 9, 10, whatever they're on right now, uh, that would have been a really good front runner for it, plus 10 years of experience dealing with it uh, would, would have helped a lot. But because of that wide breadth of what Panair does, our key focus is, the, was, is and was the distribution, making sure we could, you know, quote, to cash that process. Um, and, and this actually will fall into how we approached our implementation, but it was focus on, but it was focus on distribution and then start focusing on the manufacturing and engineering aspects. Um, so we, we got to keep that core business alive. Well, and then again, before we dive into the Acumatica side, what about, um, how, how big is Pen Air now? It sounds like with adding those business units, you're a growing company. What's like your ballpark annual revenue and number of employees, if you can share that? Yeah, absolutely. So we're, we're approximately 30 million annual revenue. Um, we have uh, at last count 84 employees. So again, small company, but growing. Uh, when I started, we were 74 employees. And, uh, you know, we've, we've got some, uh, uh, a five-year plan, which will see some serious growth, uh, assuming economy turns around. Okay. And I, I think it's interesting that you're in the York Lancaster area. I I had never been there before until last year. I actually went to and it's a very Amish kind of an area and it it's this is just my first impression of it that it's a it's an area for makers. You know, like it's mm -hmm. you make stuff, make quality stuff. At least that's my Right. That, there's my impression of my, my first visit to the area. And it, it seems interesting to me with the Acumatica selection because Acumatica has got a similar company culture. It's a, it's a maker produce a good product kind of a culture. Right. And I, and I'm curious, did, did you find any of that in your selection? Did you feel like you had a similar, mm, your company values were similar to what you were sensing with the Acumatica product at all? Yeah, absolutely. So um, in, in all openness, I'm, I'm a transplant myself, born and raised in Michigan, moved out here in uh, 96. And uh, so uh, having that first impression, as you're saying, it is a little bit of farmland everywhere. People take care of their yards really well out there, I noticed. Yeah, absolutely. There's a, there's a mystique to it. Uh, so I, I know that <laughs> perception. Um, and, and yeah, absolutely. This is a, a very maker driven um, area. Uh, so, uh, be, you know, one of the things that drew us to Acumatica was um, the fact that the core product had a lot into it, uh, but bolt-ons were really easy to do through the customization. So not only could we add our own feature set, but there was a fairly wide, you know, deep marketplace out there. Uh, to enhance the things that, that, you know, aren't native or aren't really great in the, in the package itself that, uh, you know, somebody else can just focus on that one component. And we, we've got our fair share of, of ISVs that we are using for that reason. So absolutely, uh, you know, the, the whole ecosystem that, that they provide really, uh, absolutely, uh, you know, the, the whole ecosystem that, that they provide really, um, just, just it meets the niche that uh, where we work and how we want to work. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Let's um, let's get through the implementation. Then I'd love to hear some about the customization of the ISVs at Chesera. So it sounds like Acumatic made it through the selection process, and then it was what was the date that you started your implementation process? January first, twenty nineteen. Start of the year. Okay. And then when did you go live? How long did it take? So our initial plan was to go live in July. Uh, figured we would use the, the long weekend uh, leading into the 4th of July. And uh, 
I'd love to say that that worked out, but it did not. It was uh, a, a, a horrific failure uh, going into it. And uh, we ended up flipping back onto tribute uh, a few days into the, into the attempted go live, um, which really that it was a, it was a positive uh, thing for us to have to go through uh, simply because we learned so much, not only about Acumatica, but about the Pen Air company itself. I mean, we had some assumptions that weren't true, um, that that really didn't they, they would never have surfaced without a go live. Uh, so boy, does that sound like a familiar story? <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I, I imagine. Uh, so uh, we we regrouped um, pretty much. Uh, so go live for us was you know that Monday of uh, the first week of July. And uh, we, we called it on just actually on the fourth uh, in the afternoon. We finally said, look, there's no way we're going to be able to have this up and running for Friday because we had some people coming in. And uh, so we, we switched back over. We came in Friday morning and right now, and we just whiteboarded and went back to square one and said, all right, what did we do wrong? What do we need to fix? How do we take care of this? How do we reposition the, the roles in the process itself? And you know, how do we get this back on track? And so we started that the, the next morning and uh, we officially went live on December 10th of 2019. Okay. So the, I think the most interesting part is what the failures were, if you can share them. What, what were some of those core lessons like that you could share with other people implementing Acumatica. Yeah, sorry, I got to turn the lights back on here. Automation at its best some days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, we really hit a, a, a couple things and, uh, you know, it, it was a mix between our partner um, making some of their own assumptions. We really hit a, a, a couple things and, uh, you know, it, it was a mix between our partner um, making some of their own assumptions, as well as, uh, again, Pen Air having our preconceived notions. Um, so from, a, from our partner side, uh, they, I don't think they quite understood the, the scope of, you know, the volume of part numbers that we actually have, um, the time it would take to bring our data forward. Uh, a key component for our company is having all the history of our, our prior transactions. And you know, we, in the old tribute system, we had 24 years. That's a ton of data to bring forward and a lot of effort. Yeah. We actually narrowed it down to seven years sales, three years purchasing. And you know, bringing that forward, uh, I believe Frank told me that sales, three years purchasing. And you know, bringing that forward, uh, I believe Frank told me that it would take about a month for them to transact that data and walk it through the system. So it's at a point where we're ready to move forward. Uh, they kind of said, <laughs> we're stuck about three and a half months into it and said, I'm not sure how long this is gonna take. So we, we had to kind of re revisit some things. And I think that's at the time where we said, cut the, the number of years back to something more manageable. Um, from Pinair side, uh, everyone thought they knew what the processes that we followed. And we found out that the majority of people knew what buttons to click, where to type information in the old system, but they didn't know why and where it went after that. And even though we still, you know, we did our fair share of due diligence, uh, it was certainly not had three different partitions, if you will, to it, which equated to three different companies two of which did, but they didn't know that. And you know, they didn't realize how the data was showing up until we were trying to figure out if I have a single part number, why does it translate to three different parts? <laughs> so just, gotcha. just a, a big mix of, of lack of real knowledge over how the old system functioned and uh, why it functioned that way. So, you know, as I said, without that first go live, these are things that would not have come to the forefront um, and, and where we could actually fix them uh, to, to a rational state. Uh, so 
um, following that first bill go live uh, between our um, myself. Well, yeah, go ahead. On that real quick, it sounds like it was mainly a data conversion hard stop that you hit, but then there was also a big piece of it was process. And I'm always curious how, uh, and in your experience, it's something I still struggle with. Curious how, uh, and in your experience, it's something I still struggle with. How you one get your hand around the process, and then second, how you document the processing because. It's one thing for one person to know it in a conference room. It's another thing to get that knowledge distributed out to the whole company. And were there any specific tools that you used or technique that you used to get through that that process uh, blockade that you found? Yeah. So a, a, a tenant, we actually violated a fair share of time. But one of the big things we really wanted to do was try to use Acumatica in an out-of-the-box fashion. So rather than changing it to totally mimic the processes we're, we were doing, we wanted to conform to how Acumatica wanted something to flow. And uh, honestly, this, this is one of the things that I, I believe hindered our first go live was we never had a, a of this is Acumatica straight out of the box. Let's enter a quote, walk it through the entire process to cash see how that hits the GL and really understand, you know, from the sales demo database, if you will. Um, not having that understanding of Acumatica, we, we basically approached it, you know, I had my Epicor background. Uh, I knew kind of how things would flow. Um, they had their tribute background and they knew how they would like it to flow. And we ended up trying to shoehorn that more into Acumatica than bending to how Acumatica works. Um, and we still sort of occasionally find ourselves doing that even today. We're, we're smart enough to say, hold on, this is what we see as the flow in the system. We need to step back and really revisit why we're doing something. And if, we're, if this is the right approach or um, and most of the time we find that the new process will do what we need it to do. It's just, a, it's a mentality shift. Um, gotcha. So, and you know, I, having, and I wonder too, just a, I wonder, who knows, but I, I feel like that is, I like the maker mindset. I myself think that way, but I think that is a, a downside of that. The maker mindset is that you go off and create it rather than understand something that might already exist, right? So right, that's that's right. interesting. I wonder if that culture played into that. But I, I think it's also a very common story because it's two sides of the same coin. You have to understand Acumatica, but then you also have to understand your business, which you don't understand as well as you think you do. No one does. And those two sides are always at play. It's not just learn Acumatica. It's not just learn your business. It has to be both. And they they come together, but where they come together depends on the situation, whether you, it has to be both and they, they come together, but where they come together depends on the situation, whether you customize or whether you use Acumatica. So, uh, you know, that kind of struggle is very common, I think, for people to go. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with you on that. Um, you, you get so used to doing your job that you, you make tweaks in a process, you don't document it because, hey, I do this every day. It's, it's you know, just muscle memory at that point. And, you know, 20, 30 years go down the road. And, that, and I will say for Penn Air, that is the normal. Most of our employees have been here 20 or 30 years. So when they put tribute in, they're still here doing it. So they know why it went in. They sort of know what's going on and everybody just latches on to that. So, you know, documentation is a huge piece of, of any system, uh, but it's really easy to get away from that, just saying, oh, well, we all know why we do it, uh, but it's really easy to get away from that, just saying, oh, well, we all know why we do it, so why do I need to write it down? That actually comes back to bite us <laughs> in our process of, of implementing, uh, of course. How, uh, how did you do it then? How did you document or how did you distribute that process knowledge to the team? What tools did yeah. you use? Um, so we actually do a couple of, of different things. Uh, one, um, you know, using Visio to actually do flow diagrams through Acumatica. Um, okay. So screen transitions, you're in here. This is the, the data that you have. You, this is the next screen or the next, 
part of the process flow and really trying to help draw that out because the pictorial is a really beneficial thing when you're trying to train. Um, when we do our actual written work instructions, um, you know, we're going to do screenshots with call outs. So, you know, an arrow pointing to a field saying, um, you know, so we have a, you know, step one, two, three, four, by the numbers approach to that document. Um, my, my goal and what I, what I keep trying to, to relay to people is a work instruction has to be good enough that I can hand it to a person that just walked in the door and they can sit down and actually accomplish that task. Love it. Uh, yeah. Always easier said than done. Um, not always 100% followed, but that is what we really strive to do is to make sure that the newest employee can do any of the tasks because, you know, hey, somebody's going to be sick someday, people leave jobs, you know, we want to make sure that that tribal knowledge of the past is now documented knowledge that can be transferred to the, you know, whoever needs to step in. And then where do you distribute that? Like, is it sitting in a SharePoint site, Acumatica wikis? Where do people go? To Starting to put a SharePoint, um, for lack of appropriate term, quality management manual in place. Um, you know, trying to follow more of the ISO standards of a, of a QM manual, uh, having all the work instructions centralized, version controlled. Uh, so that's what we're working towards today. Um, you know, we have our, our little network storage that the IT department maintains. We have them all in there. Um, there's a bunch that float through email. So it's, it's a little haphazard, you know, definitely room for improvement. Uh, but we are focusing on that at this point. Uh, so in the end, it's going to be in SharePoint. Do you find that people print them and put them up in their cubicles? Uh, a few people, not many. There are a few. Um, I have looked at embedding them into the Acumatica wiki and really trying to utilize that for central repository because it's not many, there are a few. Um, I have looked at embedding them into the Acumatica wiki and really trying to utilize that for central repository because it's right there on, you know, at your fingertips without having to go anywhere. And, uh, Got so far, uh, had had a lot of the manufacturing stuff, that, you know, written up and put into there um, and then kind of fell short of actually getting it to surface into the, you know, click the help button and, and be able to search it. Um, and then time, <laughs> time got in the way and I, I got diverted onto a different task. <laughs> Interesting. I, I'm very interested in this because I myself haven't gone into it as much as I would like to, but I actually went to several years ago, a three-day workshop, uh, um, a father-son team down in Dayton, Ohio, Graham process mapping. And all they do is, is document business processes, business processes. And they actually came up with their own software to do it because the struggle is that when you, with Visio, with PowerPoint or anything, when you have to insert something, then you have to move everything else around, right? It's really time consuming. Right. So they came up with a way where it actually, you, you document it in their software and then their whole goal was to print it. And they did like vector-based printing where you could scale it to as large as you want. So you basically tell it the paper size. And then if you do it on like this big engineering plotter, you mm -hmm. could get this gigantic paper that stretches across the mm -hmm. conference room. Wow. And they described the scenario that I, I've never experienced myself, but it sounded really cool, where they would go in, they'd sit with the people who actually do the work, they document the process in their software, and then they print it out on like engineering sized paper so they could stretch it across an entire conference room. <laughs> then they would pull the people into the conference room and they'd have 10 to 20 people standing on paper so they could stretch it across an entire conference room. Then they would pull the people into the conference room and they'd have 10 to 20 people standing around this chart that goes across the whole room and looking at it together and going, oh, you do that? Oh, you do that? And that, that physical repu representation of something that has to be much larger than your computer screen can handle mm -hmm. is some, some really cool end result to me. I've never done it personally, but I've, I've always um, you know, been wanting to see it have happened in the real world. And that's why I ask these questions around process yeah. and how other people do it. No, I, I, that sounds amazing. Uh, 
we we did something similar, if you will, and definitely much lower tech. So in our in our uh, main training room, the whole one wall is just a whiteboard. So it's the the you know sticky back. You got a nice whiteboard, roll it out in your wall kind of approach. And so we took those Visio diagrams. We actually were were talking about kits, you know, stock kits, non-stock kits, manufacturing process with bill of material, helping people to understand the differences, uh, what are the pitfalls, what are the, the pros, you know, the pros and cons approach. So we had all three flow charts drawn up on this whiteboard. And we did a, basically a week's worth of uh, training with each department. Because uh, at the time we were trying to use uh, best fit, uh, you know, approach based on what they're trying to do. Um, so early on in our process, we, we grabbed onto stock kits, ran into problems, moved to non-stock kits, ran into different problems. And eventually we, we dropped all of that, were strictly production and bill of materials uh, for all of that aspect of it. Uh, but you know, trying to teach them the flows. So yeah, we had it on the whiteboard, much larger than you know any printer I could. You know, trying to teach them the flows. So yeah, we had it on the whiteboard, much larger than you know any printer I could do in the office. We don't have the plotter at this point, so I can't do the nice C and D size paper. But uh, the whiteboard worked great, and you know, it, it did allow That's for that the same thing. point. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, it's that gigantic. To me, it's that gigantic physical representation of it. Another, when I saw a video on LinkedIn, like maybe a couple of years ago, someone who was implementing their ERP system, they did a similar idea with their open items list and they used sticky notes and they had a designated wall in the office and they had, you know, like the to-do side and the completed side. And that physical process of huddling people around for their weekly or daily meeting and physically moving sticky notes from one side to the other there's something about that that I think really resonates with teams as opposed to it just being digital. And, and that's why I'm, I'm really interested in that stuff. I just haven't had it stuck in people's heads. Absolutely. Um, you know, for, for me, I'm, I, I try to bridge the, the analog and digital world with paper versus OneNote or, you know, whatever else. Uh, Evan, he's 21 years old. He's all digital, doesn't want to touch the paper. So trying to bridge that gap and, and put it up there, but also be able to work with, you know, the the staff that's been here for 30 you know years, where their digital feel isn't quite up uh, at the at the level of a 21 year old, and and I absolutely agree. Being able to physically check a box or move a piece of paper from one side to the other, it's rewarding in itself, um, and and it it isn't the same feel when you're just clicking a button on a screen. Um, so, you know, throughout you know, our first failed go live, we had the entire wall was written on. We had additional, we had the entire wall was written on. We had additional whiteboards brought in with different tasks of what needs to happen, when it needed to be completed, prioritizations, all that kind of thing. Um, so I, I'm totally on board with you having that physical impact one makes it a little more real, but it, it does give you a satisfaction of, hey, we tossed that to the other side of the line. That's done. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. It's something I've, I've, I'm more the digital person myself. It's something I've been learning more recently that there is a physical side to being a human being that digital cannot replace. Yeah. And especially yeah, when it absolutely. comes to teams. That, uh, so Sorry for the process digression. I just, you can tell I'm interested in that kind of thing. And, yeah, sure. Um, and, and how you guys, because getting live on Acumatica, sometimes it's like, it's this magical, mysterious process sometimes. It's, it's not scientific. And I was like hearing how. And you, you got to have things in the right formula, the right, the right uh, uh, order, but you, you get to a point where there's magic in it and you, you hit just the right thing at the right time. It's like, whoa that worked and I don't know why. <laughs> so yeah, we, so we've weird. seen plenty of that. <laughs> <laughs> but you did get live and um, what did you go live with? Like what modules and how many companies? Yep. So on uh, the, let's take a few years now to the Acumatica side of things. Yeah. So uh, we are a single company in Acumatica. Um, we, we went live uh, actually as a SaaS customer. 
Uh, so it was in Amazon with Acumatica managing all the back end. Um, we focused on just the core. So, um, you know, it was uh, sales, it was uh, just, you know, the warehouse side of it and accounting. Um, knowing full well that the entire production, the production module uh, fairly quickly. Um, so we went live with those three components. Um, still had plenty of, of fun and excitement uh, for us to, to do to clean up things uh, at go live time. And uh, because of the, what I call, a, I don't know if it's the redheaded stepchild syndrome or it's the black sheep, but Kits in Acumatica are, are the, well, they're, they're, they're horrific. <laughs> they just don't do what quite you want them to do. And uh, we, we do a lot of effectively what comes down as a bill of material. So you have a single line item on your sales order and you have a list of materials that it's made of. Uh, to recreate that, you know, stock kits seemed great, but they don't connect to a sales order. So I don't have a one-to-one -one connection. You're building stock kits build to stock, uh, but we didn't use them that way. And um, so we use them that way. And um, so we switched to non-stock kits because uh, we had other, other visibility problems. Non-stock kits seemed really well, but they don't allocate until they're on a shipment. So inventory was being pulled in multiple directions when we thought it was going to a specific order. So that didn't work out very well. Uh, so the, the, basically the, the last half of December was really, uh, just getting the process flows more appropriate to how we need them to work. And January was trying to figure out what in the world do we do with these kits, um, comes into mid February. And what we originally planned to be a three month process to roll out the man, the manufacturing module turned into a two week process of oh my goodness, we got to get off kits. They're causing too much trouble. Eric, go make bill of material work. <laughs> and we ended up doing it in two weeks. <laughs> so, wow. <two> weeks. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah. So I don't recommend that. <laughs> <laughs> financials and distribution in what, from January to December in a year and then manufacturing in two weeks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that was that was getting it functional within two weeks so that they could work. I mean, it, it took uh, probably another month of of almost just pure focus to work through a lot of nuances because because we have such a broad uh, company of what we do. They're all a little different. You got a lot of niches. You got some customers or vendors have certain needs and, and requirements So trying to work all those into that that production flow. Um, it, it definitely took uh, uh, at least another month, month and a half to get there, uh, but uh, we're we're actually doing quite well on that today. Um, what about customizations? Did you? There's always you know, some minor stuff, but um, so uh, out of the out of the starting gate, we uh, went with um, IIG for their rebates package. Um, so we do vendor rebates, um, you know, for certain product lines that we buy, we pass through a, a discount to the customer. We get to take a rebate against that. Uh, so IAG has a really nice product for that. Um, we partnered with, um, it's Mapadox. Uh, they're now owned by SPS for EDI. Uh, we're actually still working through that, um, the their vendor side uh, is a, a work in progress. It's it's kind of a beta product we're helping them with. Um, so we're we're still working through that one even today. Um, we have a little store, uh, so you can come in and you bring your hose into the store. They'll find out what's wrong with it, build you a new one. Um, we have a little store, uh, so you can come in and you bring your hose into the store. They'll find out what's wrong with it, build you a new one, uh, sell parts through it. So we do have a point of sale system. Uh, we started with Fusion, uh, ran into some issues and ended up switching to one retail, uh, which has been a fabulous product. Uh, really good group of guys to work with there. Um, we have commission software uh, for our, you know, commissioning for our sales guys. Uh, so we went with SimFinTech for, for that product. 
And uh, that, that team has been a godsend. We've worked a lot with them, uh, one, to understand the product, but also to make it work within all the different aspects that we do. And, uh, you know, Jorge and, and uh, his team is just fabulous. Uh, so I can't, can't speak well enough about Symphentech. Uh, we do use Avalara for sales tax. Speak well enough about Symphentech. Uh, we do use Avalara for sales tax. Um, you know, it's more built in, but it's still sort of a, a third party. And uh, we recently switched to APS for credit cards and click to pay. Uh, aside from, you know, so, so those are the ISVs. I was like yeah, hearing sorry, about so, that. Yeah, yeah that, so, so yeah, those go, are the ahead, ISVs, yeah. Those are the ISVs that we partnered with. Um, our, our actual, you know, Acumatica partner um, has built some customizations for us. Uh, they actually did a very nice, um, uh, what we call comments system. So notes on line items or uh, headers for sales orders. Um, in our old tribute system, they could go into their order, enter a comment and say which documents they want that to appear on. So when they print, it would actually have that comment carry through. Um, not something, um, we've done some of our own internal development. Uh, so one of the, the things that caused some of our, our data issues, if you will, is we decided to, instead of using vendor part numbers as our stock item numbers, we went to an internal, what we call a pen air part number. So in the system, you know, part number is a PA, bunch of zeros with a number. The vendor could be 2327. Um, and the reason we did that is over time, vendors change their part numbers. Sometimes they'll have a dash, sometimes they don't. Uh, we wanted to isolate our, our hit on how it hits our system. So we don't care what the vendor's part number is. We can change that anytime. Our internal part number is what we live and die by. Uh, however, People don't know those, <laughs> you know, 20, 30 years of experience knowing that uh, a QE2 is a specific manifold. Years of experience knowing that uh, a QE2 is a specific manifold. And I call that a PA 10,021. And, you know, okay, that's a great number, but it doesn't mean anything. So we created a translator. Uh, we have a, a couple of screens where you can upload a spreadsheet of uh, all the parts you're interested in translating, and this works really well with bill of material, you give it the vendor part number or a customer part number, it looks up based on the stock items cross-reference and will return what our part number is, so our PA number. And instead of having to take an hour to research 20, 30 part numbers, it does it in a matter of seconds. You can then bring that down put it into your spreadsheet to upload into your bill of material. And now you have what the real part number is and this saves you time and effort. Um, we extended the case functionality so that uh, we can actually create another order um, and you know, thinking returns on this one. Uh, so we have a, you know, a customer wants to return some parts uh, on their order. You create that case. You say, here's the things they want to return. You can create an RMA from it and it'll have that, you know, kind of follow the lifespan of that, that order. Um, so we, we did that as well. Um, and then some custom printing things within the manufacturing product itself for material pick tickets, things like that. So it's, it's, it's been fun. <laughs> kind of tweaks the developer side that we have. Uh, so we get to have a little bit of fun and uh, you know, make some products that have, have really helped streamline some processes. When you say we, does that mean you took on some of those or at least maybe on the reporting side? Correct. So um, oh, okay. I built the inventory translator. Evan built the case uh, component on how you're doing it. The device hub, the version we had didn't allow us to send custom jobs to it. So we actually have a beta device hub sitting next to the, the release device hub. Uh, it got a little complex, but, uh, you know, we're, we're solving issues uh, by getting a little creative and playing into that maker, you know, backfield that you were talking about. Yeah, um, I, I'm interested on the device hub part. When you say the beta, 
Do you mean you've got your like your own device hub, or you've got a, a beta version from Acumatica of the next it, device hub? It, yeah, it's a, it was a, an Acumatica version that they weren't yet ready to release, but the uh -huh. um, I, I believe there was a checkbox that was removed from the release version that still existed in the beta, and that checkbox is what we needed to be able to toggle in order to print our custom report. So, Interesting. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, loss. there's the maker. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, loss. there's the maker stuff coming out, and it, it, and I feel like that that's a key thing that sells Acumatica with a lot of people. It's companies that like getting into the tech. That's something they know that even if it doesn't check all the feature boxes compared to what you're comparing it to, you know, down the road you can be able to build more stuff. And sounds like you're already doing that. Absolutely. Sounds like it's starting to get fun. You made it through the pain of the implementation. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Interesting. So, um, so you're on manufacturing now. You're on distribution, financials. Yep. You got a bunch of ISV products. You're starting to tweak things. Where do you see things going the next couple of years? Yeah. What kind of projects do you have so, on the horizon? So today we are in the middle of implementing projects. Uh, we have service and equipment modules that our, our teams are testing out. Um, so we, we've got them in place, but in, in our test environment, so they can sing out. Um, so we, we've got them in place, but in, in our test environment, so they can run some transactions, uh, really get a feel for it, make sure we have the configuration right. Uh, down the road, we're looking at adding the, the routing module for uh, field service. Uh, we want to get into e-commerce, um, getting HR, actually doing time and expenses, um, more of the warehouse and manufacturing uh, automation uh, within the data collection side, uh, warehouse management. Um, looking at, uh, we actually just watched a, a video for the warehouse management piece in the in the manufacturing data collection using you know the the mobile device and that thing looks amazing so we're, we're really excited for that one um, on the customer side we're looking at uh, doing a bit more customer edi customer portal um, allowing some accessibility into the environment so they can look at or that one um, on the customer side we're looking at uh, doing a bit more customer edi customer portal um, allowing some accessibility into the environment so they can look at orders and you know, maybe follow up on cases. Um, the big thing that we really want to do, so right now we're on 2019 R2. Uh, my goal is hopefully by Q3, we're on 2020 R2 uh, because there's many things in there that we've been asking for um, for oh, feels like almost a year uh, wanting to do, and those almost all fit in 2020 R2. So we were really excited watching the launch for that one. Uh, so big list of right. in, interests and wants, um, but uh, you know that's that's the kind of company we are. Is you know we're happy where we're at, but we know we can do more, do better, and, and really make it so that our customers get a lot more. In this hybrid scenario of manufacturing and construction, you're the hybrid of distribution and manufacturing, but I think Acumatica has got an even more compelling story on the manufacturing construction side. Is your project need uh, more of a construction need or more like for internal project tracking? Uh, it's, it's actually, if you think about it as more of a construction need. Um, so today our, our engineering services are using the manufacturing module because of the bill of material component. And we shoehorn them into the process. Um, but unfortunately it, 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 it kind of forces them to, to, uh, almost do less than what they want to do because of how restrictive it is. And what I mean there is, you know, if I have a bill of material, I need a stock or a non-stock item in Acumatica for every line of, of information. I have a bill of material, I need a stock or a non-stock item in Acumatica for every line of, of information that they have on that list. In a project, I don't. You know, we can, we can have more flexibility in there. Uh, so, down, you know, kind of our long-term perspective is our engineering services all work on projects. Obviously, the manufacturing production side is going to live in manufacturing. Um, 
and you know our, our service guys so we have we do have field service I probably failed to mention that um, so those gentlemen um, obviously we want them living in the service module but I believe they also are going to have some project side of things that are going to spawn from there as well so you know really trying to find again it's almost that stock non-stock kit versus bill of material what's the best mode to meet that specific groups need you know we we don't want to force them to do perspective uh, i would also say that you know personally some of my prior experience with projects from epic core have given me some preconceived notions that maybe aren't necessarily true with how acumatica projects function and so we're we're currently uh kind of struggling with you know we're a very sales order driven company how does this project connect to a sales order you know obviously you got a project box but if i if i you know going through the opportunity process i create a project how do i create a sales order from that without having to rekey everything likewise how do i get a purchase order from that project without having to rekey everything uh because we're, we're very much you know as we're an automation company we don't like doing rework over and over just to create a new document so my background says oh this should work this way and what i'm seeing in act so my background says oh this should work this way and what i'm seeing in acumatica it's not quite connecting the dots so really trying to to learn the right process for acumatica and how we either need to adjust our thought process as a business and say not everything requires a sales order you have that project quote in your opportunity, you converted it to a project. So that's technically your order um, and being able to run from there. So, you know, we got some, we got some learning to do on that one on the project side. Uh, we've got a couple live projects that, that are moving forward and that's really where we're getting these questions from. Uh, you, you can only do so much in testing before you say, hey, we need to actually do something real. And that's where you're really gonna find out what you know or don't know. And, you know what you have yet to configure so yeah projects has been a an interesting one You're right uh, the whiteboard <laughs> behind my desk is chock full of different you know drawings and you know process flows and lots of lists <laughs> well that sounds interesting i i found similar holes in that area connecting pro projects to distribution the sales order seems to be very helpful but there's still some missing links but i still feel optimistic I mean, it's it's just now in 2020 R2 that you've actually got construction in the core product and manufacturing in the core product. I'm really optimistic that in the next few years, we see a lot more connecting of the dots between them. Maybe you have to do some custom stuff in the meantime. But that hybrid story, I think, is very compelling yeah. for Acumatica. That's that's absolutely the one thing I've I've learned and noticed with Acumatica is what you have today isn't what you're going to have tomorrow they're going to improve that they're going to expand it it's a matter of when and what you need. isn't what you're going to have tomorrow they're going to improve that they're going to expand it it's a matter of when and what you need to do in the meantime uh to, to get to the point where it is in that core product uh they're, they're they absolutely do a fabulous job on their development totally agree Hey, I know I, I dropped an hour on your calendar. I've got another 20 minutes or so. You've got a lot of great information. I don't know if you got another meeting to run to. Quick time check. I'm good for another half hour, so we're, we're, we got it. So let's see. We, we've kind of run the, the gamut across a, a bunch of bunch of different things, timeline-wise, company-wise, your background-wise. Maybe I'll just uh, – what, what other things – would you like to highlight maybe from the perspective of the rest of the Acumatica customer community, uh, what other things you think would be nice to bring up? Okay. Uh, as we were going through the implementation process, uh, one, being able to post comments on there and getting some fairly quick feedback, uh, but also digging in and finding that information without having to, you know, scour Google and, you know, if you Google Acumatica, you get a lot of resources, but not necessarily what you're looking for. And uh, so having that forum available was a 
you know, as a kind of a one-stop shop was really nice. Um, with the, the new Acumatica communities, we're, we're excited for that. And, uh, you know, to see how that grows and expands that capability. Um, one of the other things we actually used a fair amount and still use a fair amount on our development aspects is the Asia blog. Um, you know, we, we stumbled on that one day and, uh, you know, it was one of those holy cow moments where you want to get down. It was one of those holy cow moments where you want to get down and geeky. They do it every single post. And, uh, you know, so we, we actually relied on that to do some of our customizations. So, you know, appreciate a shout out to the team that, that manages that product as well, because it, it's just fabulous. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I can't say enough on, on the, the community resources that are out there that you can stumble into. Uh, they've just been a huge help uh, to, you know, at, at this point, two guys that knew nothing about Acumatica. And, you know, now I, I feel like I have at least maybe 30% understanding of it, quite honestly. Uh, you know, it's such a gigantic product with, with so many, you know, holes that you can drill into. Um, you know, I probably know it better than 30%, but, you know, when you look at it, it's like, wow, I never knew that. The number I feel, and, and I'm not trying to even increase it. I'm just trying to maintain it because it seems like if you do nothing, the percentage <laughs> of your knowledge of Acumatica just diminishes <laughs> That's exactly because the rest right. of you know, what they keep adding keeps growing. <laughs> That's exactly right. I, I was, uh, we, we had a, a lunch and learn with our customer service group yesterday, uh, helping them understand a little better the flow of production and how it actually works in the system, what the different status means on the, on the orders. And, uh, you know, uh, now, now I'm going to forget the specific details, but, you know, we, we said, hey, when you do this, this field doesn't automatically update. And the, the customer service manager is like, oh, no, yeah, it does. I'm like, no, I'm pretty sure it doesn't. She's like, no, yeah, look, check it out. So things changed from the last time I looked at it. I was like, oh, okay, I'll remember that one from now on. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely. So if, if, if you're that's not continuing. And I think that's where the community side is so big because there's only so much that release notes and you know official help material can do. A lot of it just has to be real person-to-person -person communication. That's why yeah. I like you walking through your ISVs because I always like to hear the latest on what people are using, you know, not just what's on the marketplace as a list, but what are people's real experiences with it. And I think community is really big on that kind of stuff. What's what's the real stories behind things? Yeah, abs absolutely. It, it, these products are too huge for the the what I'll say vendor themselves to fully document. And, you know, they're designed to be something for everyone, so they can't make different documentations for everybody. You know, it, it's kind of how I explained to Seth when he asked about why reporting out of the box didn't do what he thought it would do. And I was like, well, Seth, they, they give you a basic template so that you can see here's what you can know. It, it's kind of how I explained to Seth when he asked about why reporting out of the box didn't do what he thought it would do. And I was like, well, Seth, they, they give you a basic template so that you can see here's what you can do, but to actually make it fit yours, you have to customize that. They can't make a pen air report that's canned, you know, because my report isn't going to look like your report. You know, even though it's a sales order, I want it to be a little different. I have my nuances. So that, that fact, that knowledge, you know, you just, you got to do your own documentation. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I, I think, um, you know, sort of on that point, one thing that I haven't done a ton with, but that I think is going to uh, really impact what people do with Acumatic over the next few years is the new workflow engine that I think is going to uh, really impact what people do with Acumatic over the next few years is the new workflow engine. And I can't recall now if it was 2019 or two, if you even have it in your version yet, but the ability to do more and more low code, no code stuff 
is just going to blow the doors off things. <laughs> you think yeah. We think we have a hard time keeping up with just the new features. Well, now you're going to be able to walk into, from a consulting perspective, walk into an environment that could have a completely different workflow because they tweaked it without coding. Uh, I'm curious if that is that on your radar, is, or is that maybe something for after the upgrade? So when we, I I'm not aware of it being in 2019 R2. I think that might be a 2020 new, truly new thing. Um, but I know when when we watched the R2 launch. Uh, that workflow with the AI capabilities, one of the reasons we're pushing to try and really fast track to R2. And, uh, you know, as much as we like to code, we do like to keep things, you know, canned out of the box so that it's it's less of an issue when we do those migrations and, uh, you know, those, those upgrades. So anything we can do that uh, keeps us from the customization is, a, is an amazing thing to be able to use. Um, and also, enabling some of our more power users to be able to do it you know we're not we're not going to say you know hey manager you can go and create your own customization but i'm perfectly fine with if you can make a workflow that that meets a need for you we're, we're going to get behind that uh, so I, I do like that it takes some of the um the uh, development if you will off of my staff and and it gets a little bit more load balanced i think that's going to be a benefit and uh, the more your the more they understand, the better your system's going to run. You know, don't just put information in and fill a screen and move on your way. Understand why you're putting it in there, how it's going to help the next guy down the road. You know, we we talk about that all the time. Of you know, why do you need to put a weight on a stock item? We're not using that in the screens that they deal with, but the guys in shipping want to know that. More importantly, our customers want to be able to have us rate shop. So let's put the weight in there so I can tell you, here's your options. We'll save you some money. Uh, if you don't if you don't think of those, you're just going to say, oh, man, Eric's making me put data in the system that I don't need to know. Now that I'm just making them do more work. <laughs> you know, the reality is we're saving somebody else more time and we're value adding to a customer. And it's yeah, I think that, right, that, you're right back there. Yeah. Too to the whiteboard, to the process flows, to having gatherings of people that are not just flows, to having gatherings of people that are not just meetings sitting around a table, but that have a visual in front of them that really enhances the conversation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. They, more on that new workflow engine. I, I haven't done a ton with it, but it's, it's good and bad to me in that the end result is still a customization project. Okay. So I, I don't know that it's going to be something that power users do. I think you still need a central person to deploy them because publishing a customization project is a fairly major event. But yeah. then the, the good side about it is that it's not uh, like scripting. You know, like some ERPs will allow you to do scripting on top of screens that are runtime uh, driven. That's really more outside and it's just running on top of it. There can be performance problems with that. It's easier to do, um, but published as a customization project, so it's compiled code. But it's a very uh, interesting uh, thing that's going on there with that new workflow engine. I think it's going to have a big impact on how people use the system. I think it's going to take a few years to see how it plays out in the real world. Yeah. I'm curious about it. Yeah. I Personally speaking, I know uh, developing my own customization, like truly new screens, new work, new workflow code. Um, you know, there was a, a pretty steep learning curve to getting to something I was at least comfortable putting in a live system. And uh, so, yeah. being able to to take that step up and and say, okay, we're gonna alleviate some of the coding aspect of it and give you some more workflow steps. Is, is absolutely going to open the door for, for uh, a lot more customization capability. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's allowing people that aren't quite as developed customization capability. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's allowing people that aren't quite as developer heavy to be more comfortable making those customizations, which is going to be huge. I think that's really what it is. It's still customizations, but it's low code, no code customizations. Yeah. It's not, you have to open up Visual Studio type of customization. Yeah. yeah um, absolutely. Maybe 
swinging back just to the user side, what would you say, you know, we, we, the two of us could geek out all day on Acumatica, <laughs> but, uh, you know, swinging back to the user side, how has it been from a like user experience? And, you know, now you're all in the browser. I assume your old yep. system wasn't in the browser. How has right. that been for people, especially the people who've been there 20 to 30 years? Are they still griping about not having their old system, which I think is common, or, you know, how's that adoption yeah. been for you? Actually, so so we left our old system accessible for uh, lookup matched what it used to be. So up until um, I believe end of August, we still allowed pretty much everybody to touch the old system if they needed to do some lookup. And as we'd walk around the building, you'd see a lot of people still had that old screen up. And uh, we started asking the question to the managers, what is your department, you know, what's causing them to need to have this available? Because we knew time was coming where all of the licensing that we had was going to expire, you're going to lose access. And uh, so we got that list and, you know, we started addressing, you know, how you can find that out in Acumatica with the data that we have. Um, so that helped us with just their workflow. Um, making sure they knew about some of these simple screens that have all the answers they're looking for. They just didn't know about it. Um, on top of that, it gave us the, the perspective of, you know, I want to say it was a month ago, sometime uh, into September, we actually shut off the old system for everybody but three people. And I expected to hear a, a pretty big backlash from it, and we heard nothing. I think maybe one person asked some questions that we were able to say, oh, here's, here's where you get it in Acumatica. And I was like, oh, that's great. I don't need this anymore. So we really had nothing as far as uh, complaining for shutting off the old system. And it was either Tuesday or Wednesday this week, um, all the licensing ran out. So the last three people who were in it are out and they didn't even notice. <laughs> so pretty happy from that side of it. Um, as far as the, the transition from the old to the new, it's been a mixed bag. Um, you know, we have uh, a variety of people that, you know, they've been here for 30 years. They knew exactly how to do it. Uh, it, feels like Ac uh, it feels like Acumatica is more work because it's a different workflow. Um, you know, where they used to, I mean, these guys were amazing in the old system. You know, they'd sit there and type, tab, tab, type, type, tab, tab, enter, enter, type, really fast zipping through screens. Now there's a browser, they got to click, they need to do some other things. So it feels slower, but it's the exact same process. So yeah, you'd get some complaining about that. Uh, but, but honestly, they'd find other things where it's like, oh, we couldn't do that before. I didn't have this information before. So you, you get a mix. Um, I've, I've definitely I, got, I totally agree with that. Like that, yeah. that from a data entry perspective, I still miss my VI editor in Linux. I mean, there's yep. nothing efficiency wise that compares to the keyboard and browser systems are a lot more clicking. I, I totally agree with that. Yeah. But you know, to your um, point, there's other advantages, but data entry is, is going to be a disadvantage of a browser. Yeah. But you know, to your um, point, there's other advantages, but data entry is, is, is going to be a disadvantage of a browser. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, we, we've actually taken to teaching uh, a lot of the browser shortcuts. So you can do most things in your browser on your keyboard if you know the right keystrokes. So early on, that was one of our lunch and learns was tips and tricks for Acumatica through the browser. And the very first thing we taught was, you know, here's the, the shortcuts for Chrome. Here's the shortcuts for Edge, you know, to, to do the different things. Then we went into Acumatica and started teaching what are the keyboard shortcuts in Acumatica. Um, had some cheat sheets written up that they could take away with it. And, you know, that helped a lot because as we're doing things, we're using those shortcuts and we'd be, you know, running a training session. We're like, wait, how, how'd you just do that? We're like, oh yeah, that's just this on the keyboard. Oh my gosh, that saved me three clicks. <laughs> I was like, yeah, these, these are great things you can do. Something you do on a regular basis. Sounds interesting. Uh, Internally. Regular is a, a little loaded word, but we do we do try to hold lunch and learns um, at a somewhat metered basis. Uh, so, you know, as I said, we just had one yesterday for customer service on manufacturing process uh, where our production manager came in and he and I uh, walked in through the process, answered questions so that, 
you know, they don't need to know the ins and outs by heart, but being familiar with, well, I have a sales order that needs something produced. They generate the production order from the sales order. Now what? When's it going to be ready? Do I have the parts to even make this or is it going to be delayed? So helping them answer those questions. Um, you know, so we had that. Uh, we're good actually good. We're going to have a future one specifically on audit history. Uh, so a lot of times we'll hear, why did this happen? Who changed this on me? Well, we'll see anything and everything you want. I mean, we, we audit almost everything. So that's, that's a future one. Um, we're going to have another one on APS for, uh, kind of your one-time credit card payments for a customer, making sure that, you know, we're, we're doing it the right way in the same way every time. Um, I'm trying to think in the past, we've like done that. a lot with production, honestly. <laughs> it sounds like this, these internal lunch and learns are really pure acumatica. It's not the whiteboard. It's not the business process. It's, it's mostly focused on the features of acumatica yep. that you might not know about. That's interesting. I, I'm yeah, curious absolutely. on that. Um, um, it's, it's very much. There's a guy named. Go ahead. Sorry. I, I'm I'm just curious on that. There's a, a guy named Bill Jellen who runs a website, MrExcel.com. And I, I was at a user group one time where he spoke and he's been doing it since the 1980s. And I thought he made a really interesting comment. He said, it's, it's very much there's a guy named, go ahead. Sorry. I, I'm, I'm just curious on that. There's a, a guy named Bill Jellen who runs a website, MrExcel.com. And I, I was at a user group one time where he spoke and he's been doing it since the 1980s. And I thought he made a really interesting comment. He said, every time he goes, and does a talk on Excel, which is his full-time job. And he does, he makes books and does a ton of stuff on his website. He said, every time he does an event, he always learns something new about Excel. And this is the guy that calls himself Mr. Excel. I'm curious in those lunch and learns, do you find, I think you mentioned one already, do you find that yep. you yourself are learning things about Acumatica? Absolutely. Uh, is the one I told you where, you know, the field I thought was static, you had to you know, remove it off the sales order and add it back on to update your, your unit cost field or, or whatever it was. And, you know, they're like, oh, no, that actually changed. And you can do that now. You know, little as they're utilizing them, the team finds something a little bit more proficient for them. They'll adjust the process and we'll hear about it after the fact. And some of the times it does come out in these lunch and learns where it's like, oh, hey, we don't do it that way anymore because of X, Y and Z this is how we do it. And you think about it a little bit. It's like, okay, I totally get why you did that. And it makes a lot of sense. So now you, you throw that in the back pocket. Um, a, a lunch and learn we had, I think two months ago, um, you know, we were talking about where to put uh, a specific vendor uh, piece of information, whether it was a description, the vendor inventory ID, was it a cross-reference thing? And hearing all the reasons why somebody chose one thing over another, kind of helping to build part of the new process in that lunch and learn. So, you know, as we said, at least once or twice already, you're always learning something new. So, you know, as we said, at least once or twice already, you're always learning something new. And if you, if you've, you know, if you've ever given something to someone, I guarantee you they've changed it somehow after they got it. And that change is almost always for the better. So learning that new change, and if somebody else takes that exact same thing, they're gonna change it in their own way. So, so you're always learning, you're always grabbing something new. And Acumatica themselves, will, they'll release a new update and wow, here's you know a whole release note of all new stuff to pick up on. And how did that change what I already knew? So absolutely, uh, you know, the, the lunch and learns are huge for myself as much it is for the people that are that are in the training session if you will i love it i i'm interested on in a little more of the mechanics too because and i think this is some of this is on the fly you're still learning it uh, overall though i i just love this this culture that you've embraced which i think is i, I don't know if it's uncommon or or less than the majority but I think it's hard for an IT department to adopt that culture. A lot of times the IT department has more of a uh, slap the hand of the users when they do something outside of what they're supposed to do. You've really embraced this two-way communication. I think that's, that's really admirable. And, and specifically on the lunch and learns, 
I, you know, like even with this podcast, what one of the things that was important to me for this is to have a no editing rule and just publish things immediately because I just don't have the time to do prep for it and I don't have the time to do post production for it. And I'm, I, I've been thinking about doing a similar thing that I would call AUGforums.com live, where I would do like a live YouTube event where people could interact somehow. But the, the struggle there is still the prep. And so I'm curious on the mechanics of your lunch and learn. One, how long where people could interact somehow, but the, the struggle there is still the prep. And so I'm curious on the mechanics of your lunch and learn. One, how long is it? And how much time do you find yourself prepping for it? So our, our lunch, we, we try to put a lunch and learn in an hour. Um, occasionally, they may be an hour and a half, depending on the, the depth of information or quite honestly, it could be questions that drive it a little long, but we really try to keep it in their lunch hour. Um, Cause quite honestly, while training is a huge thing to, to help them be able to do their job, they still have a job they gotta go do. So they can't spend right. two and three hours in a training session. Um, so our normal lunch and learns are, you know, 12 to one. And uh, you know, we try really hard to keep it in there. Um, we, we definitely have had training sessions where they've been four hour marathons of the, the level 400 deep dive. As far as our preparation for them, um, honestly, I think I spent 10 minutes preparing for the one yesterday. Uh, That's great. And, and, and yeah. largely that was just making sure the test environment had the data that I wanted in it because it's a little bit behind our, our production environment. So you know, we, we were, you know, making sure I had my parts, my bill was at least relatively close to what I wanted, but I had specific errors in it that we knew we wanted to fix. So teaching them, you know, if you forget to take your bomb off hold, what does it look like when you try to make a production order? Uh, how do you fix that when it happens without having to delete things? So we, we kind of build in pitfalls. Uh, and it gives me a great scapegoat if the demo doesn't go quite what I want. I'm like, oh, yeah, we plan to do that so you can see this error. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> it makes it easier for us to uh, have less time spent. It makes it easier for us to uh, have less time spent preparing for them. But quite honestly, a lot of what we're teaching, we're still actively doing uh, within our department. We, we do a lot of, of user support. Uh, we currently have a three-person IT department, including myself. So it, it's not hard to believe that we're involved on a daily basis with things. Um, so that does make it easier. And I, I have absolutely stellar um, you know, staff as well as uh, users. Um, you know, they're, they're, I would say they're, they're fairly well-informed. They're very interested in knowing what's going on. And they absolutely know their jobs really well. So coupling all that together makes it easy for me, quite honestly. I, I'm real interested in the, the prep side of it just because I've experienced this being involved with user groups. Like I was in a Power BI, if it's weekly, whatever it is, commit to it. And then the, I think what makes that hard is the prep. And, and I think if you try to keep delivering more, like you're trying to hit a home run every time, you end up prepping more and more time for every event. Yeah. Whereas if you keeping with the baseball analogy, if you just try to get a base hit and keep a similar cadence, mm -hmm. that's to me the ideal situation. But achieving that is, is I think, difficult. You know, keeping the prep low enough that you can keep them going on a regular yeah. basis. So it's interesting you said 10 minutes. I, I like that. I get yeah. excited when I hear something like that. <laughs> at, at, the, uh, at the onset, specifically customer service side, I sat down with uh, the manager and we talked through what are some of the things she saw that her staff needed some assistance with or more information on. So we have a fairly decent list that we're working towards. Uh, so, you know, going into the, you know, the lunch and learn for the week or the month, so we, you know, and I, I wanna say there's probably seven lunch and learns worth of information that we kind of documented on that day. And originally the question was, can we do this in one lunch and learn? And it's like, there is no way you're going to fit this in there with any reasonable expectation. So we said, we're going to break it into this piece on this one, this piece on the next. 
So, I, you know, 10 minutes ahead of time getting prepped for it, but in the back of my mind, it's always churning. And, you know, sure. you, you're bringing forward whatever you're learning uh, as you go towards the, that deadline of today is the lunch and learn. Um, so so there, there's, I'm sure, some kind of offline uh, planning and prepping in the back of my head. But, uh, you know, physically sitting down for a normal lunch and learn, it, it's 10, 15 minutes. If we're talking those four hour level 400 type deep dives, you know, that's a, a couple of days of really deep dives. You know, that's a, a couple of days of really making sure I have everything out. Uh, the, the printed documentation we're going to hand out for them to review, you know, all having that in line. That, that definitely takes a lot more effort. Uh, but we don't hold those often uh, for, for the obvious reasons of time. Um, but yeah, no, I, I love the lunch and learns. Um, you know, a big thing that I want to make sure we do when we're holding these is giving enough time for questions. You know, it's great for me to go and talk for an hour, but if they don't get to ask questions, I would say 70% of the benefit just went out the window. So I'd rather talk for 10 minutes and give them the other 50 minutes in order to ask questions and we can really drill into what matters to them at the moment. That's great. I love that. I think what a great note to end on, internal lunch and learns and, and how to actually do them successfully. That's awesome stuff. I like it. Cool much for the invite awesome all right well that's it for now we'll catch you on the next episode of augforums.com real talk